Hi there. My name is Sister Lisa Stallings. I'm a Sister of Providence from St. Mary of the Woods, and I'm a member of Rivers, Riverscape. And if you're not familiar with Riverscape, um, it's a not-for-profit organization dedicated to beautification and redevelopment of the Wabash River. So um, we are a sponsor of the Smithsonian uh, project. The Smithsonian, that's hard for me to say, river, waterways uh, exhibit and also of the speaker series. So I'm really happy to welcome you here tonight and uh, encourage you, if you haven't already, to go to the exhibit, which is at the uh, Wabash, excuse me, the Vigo County School Corporation building on Olive Street in West Terre Haute. You can spend a lot of time there and um, really, I think, will enjoy it and benefit from it. Uh, we're also sponsoring the speaker series, and I think some of you have already been to other uh, speakers' presentations. Tonight, we're welcoming uh, Dr. Jennifer Miller. I think you use Jenny. Yes. Yes. And uh, J Jenny is a, 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 a excuse me, professor, associate professor of civil engineering and environmental engineering at Rose Holman. Her uh, undergraduate degree is from Northwestern. Her master's and doctorate are from uh, Colorado State University. And I said to her earlier, uh, the, the title of her presentation, for me, because I'm a musician, uh, was a little bit uh, daunting. <laughs> but I, I watched her, uh, the, the uh, uh, YouTube video today, and I think you'll really enjoy her presentation and her style of presenting. So please help me welcome Dr. Jennifer Miller. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, this is a good, a good crowd that showed up tonight, so I thank you all for, for coming out. Um, so yeah, the title of my talk is Rehabilitating Streams to Reduce Non-Point Source Pollution and Stormwater Runoff. We'll get there eventually, okay? <laughs> I'm gonna take you on a little bit, a little bit of a path um, in going there. Um, and so, starting off, um, take a look at this image. Okay, so what I want to start off with uh, tonight is talking about rivers, okay, and talking about changes that we've made to rivers and the impacts that that has. Okay, so we're going to start here and then we'll make our way to, to the non-point source pollution. So one thing that you might notice here is that the levees are breached, right? Okay, that, that seems pretty obvious. So we have, um, we have the, the, levee system you see along each side and you see the breach in the levees. What do you notice about the levee breaches? They bounce back and forth. They bounce back and forth, right? So they kind of form a nice sinusoidal S curve, yeah? Going through there, okay? So, so keep that in mind. All right, so in looking at how we've managed rivers um, all through time, initially, when we started working with rivers and looking at river engineering, um, the primary idea was to control the flow in the river, right? Control it to use for whatever we needed to use it for. Okay, so we had dams, right? We did a lot of flood control, a lot of levee systems and things like that. Um, as we kind of move kind of chronologically through time, we're looking at more of an integrated management style for rivers, okay? We're realizing the impacts that these infrastructure techniques had on the river as a larger system, okay? Looking at the ecosystem that's associated with it, um, how it's impacting the water quality, and we're realizing that some of these measures although had a purpose, right, had unanticipated impacts that were associated with that. Um, so now we're looking at more of restoring the natural system, kind of bringing that natural system back into play. Um, this is an interesting thing that I found. So as a civil engineer, the founding statement um, in the Institute of Civil Engineers says that we want to harness the great sources of power in nature for use and convenience of man. Okay, and that's the mindset that was exactly done, right? So we want to take these windy, unruly rivers, right? And we want to make them straight, okay? 
for a purpose, right? To make them more navigable, right? For shipping, okay? So there is a purpose in straightening these rivers, okay? As people were developing on the land, if you're developing or trying to farm anywhere in one of these windy little curves, it's gonna flood, you're gonna lose crops, okay? You're gonna lose any development that you have. So if we straighten and train that river to stay straight, right? Then we have that much more land to grow crops to develop on, okay? So that was the initial thought. So this is an interesting, um, so you can see the date up in the corner, that's 1935. How dynamite streamlines streams, okay? So I highlighted a couple pieces here. These crooked streams are a menace to life and crops in the areas bordering the banks, right? Um, so floods result, crops are ruined, lives are lost, banks are undermined. So let us control these crazy, unruly streams, okay? The issue with that is that when you straighten a stream, okay, the actual slope or the gradient, right, that the stream bed is on increases because you're covering, you're, you're covering less of a distance over the same elevation change, right? So instead of having a length that winds all the way around this way between two heights, you have now a straight path between two heights, okay? So you're increasing that slope. This is what we call lanes balance, okay? I'm just gonna break it down and make it, make it pretty simple to, to show here. So there's a lot of things going on here, right? What we're looking at as is the geometry here of the channel. This is the stream slope, okay? That's the gradient. When we straighten the streams, we are increasing the slope, right? So we're pulling down this side of the scale. It's going to tip it this way to degradation. That means a lot of the material on the bed of the stream is going to be moved, okay? So what happens is that we have erosion of the bed material, right? Okay, so we've made these streams straight. We have a lot more power or energy in the actual river itself that causes that bed material to erode and move downstream, okay? So when we look at kind of stages of natural changes in stream pattern, okay, we have the unmodified curvy version, right? We straighten it. That causes erosion of the bed, okay? As the bed gets deeper and deeper and deeper, these bank slopes here are gonna get straighter and straighter and straighter, and then they're going to collapse in, okay? So that's what you see here, that's collapsing in, okay? So we have a lot of widening of the channel and eroding of the bed, okay? So that's kind of the natural pattern that, that happens there. Um, and it's very, going back to this, it's, it's what we call a very unstable condition, right? A lot of movement of the sediment. As you get bed eroding and the banks collapsing in, you're losing property up here too, right? You're actually losing property that's, getting, that's going into the stream. So here's an example. Um, the Kissimmee River, okay, the Kissimmee River in Florida, um, so this is an example, and I have some pictures to go along with this too, of back in the 1960s, so it didn't take too long for them to completely spend billions of dollars to restore the stream. Um, the Kissimmee River, we're probably all aware of the swampy wetlandness of most of the state of Florida, right? A lot of swamps, a lot of wetland area in Florida. Um, so what they wanted to do, again, to make the river more navigable, to be able to drain that swamp land, to be able to farm right up to the river if they wanted, they straightened it, okay? So they took this naturally windy, curvy, flood, flooded area, wetland swamp, and they made it straight to drain that swamp land and be able to utilize it, 
okay? So that was in the 1960s. Um, it is now complete, but they restored 40 square acres of that floodplain, okay? So almost 20,000 acres of wetlands and 44 miles of the river channel, okay? So what they did is, I'm gonna skip ahead and we'll come back to that. This was after it's channelized. So you see how nice and straight it is. They came in and they created that curve back, okay? So again, billions of dollars <laughs> to make it back to the way it was before, right? But what they've discovered um, is that by bringing that pattern of the river back, you're increasing dissolved oxygen content in the water, so now you have more aquatic life that can survive, okay? Because you don't have as much power and fast-moving river through this straight channel, it's slowing down, okay, as it goes through the outsides, or as it goes through around the curves, you get faster water, you get slower water, because you have patches of fast and slow water, you have different types of sediment on the bottom of the stream bed, okay? Through fast moving water, you're gonna have coarser bed material, bigger chunks of, of bed material. Through the slower areas, you're gonna have more fine particles, more little pieces of sand, okay? Through the coarser material, the bigger chunks of boulders and cobbles, you're gonna get a little more waves and turbulence. That is going to create more oxygen in the water, okay? So you get, by just changing that pattern, you're getting more of that oxygen in the water. Fish species, okay? Again, by simply changing from straight to curvy, right? Simply changing from straight back to curvy, you're getting more fish species. Does anyone have any thoughts of how that happens? creating more bedding areas? Yeah, you're creating more variety of habitat, right? You're creating more variety of habitat. You have fast moving water, you have slow moving water, you're having different types of material on the bed, you're creating different habitats, okay? So that allows for a variety of fish species. So um, largemouth bass and, large and sunfish, 63% prior to the restoration, it was 38%, okay? Um, and then another big one are birds, okay, are birds. And so you have um, eight shorebird species that were absent before returned when they restored the pattern of the river, okay? So again, just by changing that pattern, it actually has a benefit for the whole ecosystem. Okay, so some images here you see, so that is the restored piece. Um, again, the straight piece there where you see even some patches here, right, of kind of some side channels, definitely more of a wetland area up here, right? And so they restored it into more of just, again, a larger wetland. Um, and then some images here just showing all of the wildlife that has naturally come back because there's actually habitat for them. Right. Okay, so again, tying together how we're changing the actual physical piece of the river, how that impacts the ecological integrity of that spice, okay? So when we talk about our flow regime, okay, we're talking about how much flow we have. Do we have a little bit or do we have a ton? Right? Do we have like what would be in a drainage ditch on the side of the road or what would be in the Wabash River? Okay, so how, how much flow we have. How often do we get big flow events? Okay, so the frequency of these big flow events. Do we get flooding flows often or not very often? Okay, how long do they last? So all those different characteristics are going to impact water quality, okay? If we have a lot of high, fast flows, you're gonna be pushing a lot of sediment particles, a lot of 
of the um, of the sediment particles through, right? So you're not going to have as much of um, kind of what we would say would be like like dirty water, right? With all the clay particles suspended in it, so you're not going to you're going to be flushing all that through. Um, another thing that happens, um, which I'll talk about next, is when we straighten rivers, okay, and we put the levee systems in place, we don't allow the flood flows to occur, right? We don't allow flooding to occur. That has a big impact on the habitat, okay? There is a big ecological connection between the river system itself and the aquatic life and the terrestrial system, okay? There's definitely a connection there. Um, if we remove adjacent trees along the riverbanks, okay, we don't have input of energy and carbon sources into the river for aquatic life, okay? We already talked about how it changes the actual habitat, okay? And then interactions between the different life that are there. So just by changing the physical aspect of the river, we're impacting the ecosystem, okay? So this is an image that kind of is pretty self-explanatory, right? Um, when we change rivers and we remove all the vegetation next to the river, along the river banks, we don't have the input, right, of leaves, of insects, of spiders, and anything else that might be falling into the stream, okay? We have more erosion because we don't have the root mass of that vegetation holding the dirt in the banks together, right? Okay, um, we have, so you have bank erosion there. Temperature also, okay? Having shade on the stream banks keeps temperature moderated, okay? So you have more variety of aquatic life that would be able to be supported here, as opposed to just some algae and other species that are more tolerant to those extreme conditions, okay? Um, so again, kind of tying in the, the aquatic life and the terrestrial life, I like this image um, because of all the arrows and connections, right? You can see how all of these pieces are interconnected. So by having the vegetation right along the stream banks, you have different insects that are going to fall in and feed the fish, okay? Um, you have different land animals that are going to catch the bugs that are living in the stream when they emerge to adults, then you're going to feed birds and lizards that, and bats that might be terrestrial animals, okay? So you have that feedback and that linkage there. Um, so, Bringing us to, this is one of my favorite definitions of a river, right? Rivers are dynamic, evolving physical systems. The river landscape at any given time is an expression of its watershed, climate, geomorphic, and ecological history, okay? So it's not just a snapshot in time, right? That's not what makes up the full system of the river, okay? And so we're going to get into looking at the watershed piece of that. Um, so again, what I mentioned at the very beginning, right? We have our, the idea of river engineering. The key things here, looking at the scale, right? When we put a dam in place, when we straighten a piece of the stream, when we remove the vegetation on the banks, we're looking at just that particular location, right? We're not looking at how that impacts the larger system, okay? We're looking at it on a shorter time scale, not on a longer time scale, okay? Um, so looking at moving from just a point location to the whole watershed. Um, so a watershed. Um, I like to play this game in one of my classes that I teach when we start talking about the water cycle and I ask if any of them have ever heard the term watershed. So let's play along. Has anyone ever, who has heard of the term watershed? Okay, who feels like they can adequately describe what a watershed is? 
<laughs> I'm going to call on one of my students. Uh, it's like, <clears throat> I mean, it depends on the scale you go on, because you can be at a bunch of different scales, and the outlet point, but you go based on like the highest elevations in the area, and you kind of trace around from the highest elevations, and you circle, it ends up making a circle around the, uh, like the river, the stream you're looking at. And anything that lands in that area, the water would flow into that stream. Exactly. Okay, so let's thank you, Colin. So here is our Wabash River watershed, okay, outlined in yellow. Can you guys see the color difference? Right, so kind of the yellow shading, okay? Um, we are right here, okay? So anything, any water that falls on the surface in this yellow shaded area is going to end up right there where that red star is at the bottom, right? Eventually. And that's where it enters the Ohio River. Okay, so that's where the Wabash enters the Ohio River. So if you think about all the different land uses in this entire area, right? All the different land uses in this entire area we have a lot of agriculture and farming, right? So we have application of fertilizers, of different pesticides and things like that. If that is not all taken up by the crops themselves, that excess ends up right here. Okay, yep, all of that surface runoff ends up right there. Um, so oils and greases on parking lots, okay? Extra sediment, so sediment just meaning dirt, right? that ends up on any sort of surface, that water is going to pick all of that up and it's going to mobilize it and it's going to drain right to that point. Okay? If we look bigger than this, okay, we are in the Ohio River Basin, right? The Wabash goes into the Ohio. This is the Mississippi River Basin the Mississippi River watershed, right? So anything that falls on the land in that whole area eventually ends up in the Gulf of Mexico, right? That is the end point of that. And you can see here, this just shows, this another image to show, we don't just have like these two major, we don't just have the Arkansas River coming through there, we don't just have the upper Mississippi, there are a lot of other branches that come into those main pieces, right? And so all that land area that drains to that bottom point, okay? Um, you see this little red pocket right here that is called the hypoxic zone. Hypoxic meaning low oxygen or anoxic meaning no oxygen, okay? So if we look deeper into the Gulf of Mexico, we know more than half of the land area in the country drains to this point, okay? We have this area here of low oxygen, okay? Not much oxygen in the water. Not much oxygen in the water means not a lot of life, okay? The red is the lowest, the light green is higher levels. So just to kind of give you an idea, this goes from zero to eight milligrams per liter. Criteria for supporting healthy aquatic life is around five milligrams per liter, okay? So anything in this lime area and darker green could support more diversity of life. Anything less than five, it, they're gonna be struggling, <laughs> right? Um, and so the connection between this and this, okay? When and I won't, I won't ask you guys, maybe I should ask this. <laughs> Elias, do you know what's causing that? <laughs> when we have all of the agricultural land, okay, fertilizers are being applied to increase crop growth, right? Any excess that isn't taken up goes into the waterway so we have excess fertilizer, excess, excess nutrients here, 
it's gonna cause vegetation to grow, right? You're gonna get a lot of algae growing, okay? For the same reason as why we put fertilizer on our crops to get our crops to grow. You're gonna get vegetation to grow here. When all of that vegetation, all the algae die, bacteria are gonna decompose it and they're consuming oxygen during that process, okay? So that's why we get the low oxygen levels, okay? Um, so that is one of the impacts that we, that we see um, with the non-point source pollution okay, that we're getting on, on the land. Um, bringing that back closer to home, okay? So this is the outline in yellow, okay? Is the Lost Creek watershed, okay? Ending at Rose Holman's campus, <laughs> okay? Because that's just, that's what we, that's where I have it analyzed, okay? Ending on our campus. Okay, so that is all that land area, so nine acres that drains to that spot on our campus. Okay, um, so this probably looks, why, why do we have a picture of the 641 bypass? Okay, so this project um, impacted 12,070 linear feet of stream, okay? and 7.3 acres of wetland, okay? Because this was a federally funded project, or used some federal funding, um, that Im the impact on the streams and wetlands that were impacted need to be replaced somewhere else, okay? So that's what, that's what mitigation basically is, right? So it's compensatory mitigation. Um, so how did the bypass project affect Lost Creek? on Rose Holman's campus, our stream was a major benefactor of the work that was, the streams that were damaged with the bypass, okay? So we had our stream rehabilitated through our campus, okay? Because of the work that was done on the bypass that impacted streams, okay? It, it gets into a really complicated system on how they manage how that works, but we're not gonna even delve into that, okay? But the company who actually did the work on Lost Creek um, had three main goals in rehabilitating the stream, okay? They wanted to improve the bank stability. Um, prior to the, the rehabilitation happening on, on Lost Creek through Rose Holman's campus, you can kind of see some of it here, but this is actually when they started working. But right here, you see how straight up and down those banks were, right? You can kind of see it in that picture. If you remember the picture I showed at the very beginning, you probably don't know. Um, but you can see the banks are just, just bare earth, right? Vertical banks, a lot of tree roots hanging out. Um, just a, that's very unstable conditions, right? A lot of erosion happening. So improving the bank stability was very important. Um, increasing the habitat, right? We've already talked about how just changing the form from a straight to a curvy helps to improve habitat and bring a lot of different life in, okay? And improving the water quality, okay? Improving the water quality. So kind of having, basically you can think of it as like a buffer between activities that are happening on the land and different water pollutants that are occurring from the activities on the land, buffering that to prevent it from getting into the stream and affecting the water quality, okay? Um, so some things that were done, um, and I, these images came from elsewhere because um, most of the vegetation right now along Lost Creek is, you know, dying out and it doesn't look so pretty. Um, so I wanted to get pictures that looked pretty because this is what it looks like when everything is flowering and blooming, okay? Um, but having the native vegetation, so something just as simple as planting native grasses, okay? Even some that are native flowering grasses. What happens is, again, that is like a buffer or a filter strip between what is happening on the land and the activities on the land and protecting the quality, the water quality of the stream itself, okay? As the water is flowing off the land and into the stream, it's hitting that vegetation, okay? That's slowing down the velocities of, that, of the water, 
allowing any sort of particles in the water, so sediment, dirt, things like that, to settle out. Okay, so it doesn't get it, it doesn't reach the stream. Okay. Also, um, then the water is slowing down, it's infiltrating into the soil, right? So some of fertilizers or nutrients or things like that that might be in that water, dissolved in that water, also go down into the soil and are taken up into the plant. Okay, so it's really a pretty simple way to really improve the quality of the water body, okay? Um, so filtering or buffering from upland use. Another reason, which I think these images are really cool. So when we put native vegetation on the banks, okay? For example, this number 10 here is Kentucky bluegrass, okay? So common lawn turf, right? This is in feet, that's two feet, so the difference between here is zero to two feet. That is the rooting depth of the Kentucky bluegrass. It's about the same as the height of the grass on top of the surface, okay? Um, so again, this is a, a turf grass here, same thing. This one, you can probably see more definitively because of, of the colors. Um, and then we have something like, okay, let me pick out number two, okay? So this is a, a purple coneflower. You see the depths, this goes down to about 10 feet, okay? So these rooting systems help as kind of like reinforcement to hold the soil together on the banks, right? Um, you see the density of this blob right here, right, of this, this mass. So we have um, a compass plant right here. And you see how dense that root mass is, okay? So that is holding all, that, all those soil particles together to keep the banks stable so they don't erode as easily, okay? Um, this one is really interesting too. Number eight is, um, or the prairie sunflower, number seven, right? You can see that we get just mass of roots and depth that really help to hold the soil together and stabilize the banks. So native vegetation, right? Just putting some seeds in place. Um, part of the Lost Creek mitigation process, they project, they use several different techniques, okay? Um, so I'm gonna show you some pictures of these um, along the way, and you can't even see any of this anymore, right? Some of my students are on campus, you, can't, you don't even know that's there anymore. So what they did is they <clears throat> reshaped the slope, okay, to make it more stable. So instead of having it vertical banks that you're gonna get a lot of erosion and instability, just sloping them back a little bit, right, to make more, more stable slopes. Then they put seed, native vegetation, or native grasses, seed all along those banks, okay? To prevent that from washing away, they reinforced it with, this is a brush mattress right here, okay? So that just keeps the soil and the seeds in place while the vegetation establishes, okay? All of these branches came from bigger trees and things that they had to, that were either dying or were kind of collapsing into the stream from the bank erosion. They tore down some trees, they saved all of the branches and they used those for the rehabilitation technique. Okay, so all the brush that was used here came from trees that they had to cut down along the banks. So again, basically they just laid all of those branches or twigs down. Um, typically, they use like a, kind of like a, like a jute rope, okay, so a natural fiber to, you can kind of see a crisscross pattern along here to hold all those twigs in place, okay? So again, as the vegetation establishes, that's all gonna just biodegrade back into the soil, okay? Um, another image here that's pretty cool that you can actually see um, all of the crisscrossing of the rope going through. They also used a lot of live stakes, okay? So actually taking a, uh, maybe a, um, a cutoff from a willow or something like that and drove that into the ground. And so it's holding the rope and the brush in place, but then it's also gonna grow into, um, into a willow tree. Um, so that you can see as the grasses are starting to go th grow through, 
decay, and now as the grasses are growing through and more, and now you can't even see any of that underneath it. It just looks like a, a bank slope of vegetation. Okay, um, so that was a brush mattress that they use. This was a really neat concept that they did. Um, so this was called a soil encapsulated lift, okay? So basically, to get this at a stable bank angle, they didn't have the land to do that, right? They didn't have the surface land to do that to slope it back that much. So that's the drawing of it. <clears throat> this is what it looks like in place, okay? So they took, again, kind of just like a jute rope type fabric um, to really kind of get rolls of soil, right? So it's compacted, and they were able to stack it almost like stair step, okay? Again, seeding all of this, um, and then allowing the vegetation to go through, and you can't even tell that that exists. But it's much more stable than just a, a, a bank surface, right? Um, so that's another image of that. Um, so this is our, our sports and rec center. Um, that is the vehicle bridge that kind of goes across the stream, and we are looking to the west in this image, okay? So you can see, and then you see these other, like I said, live stakes that they put in that are holding down that fabric, but all also grow um, and vegetate the banks, okay? Another cool thing that they used, um, again, incorporating the trees that were cut down, okay, um, as for habitat and flow deflection, okay? So they basically, if you can see here, that's the root mass of the tree. This is the stump, okay? That's the root mass of the tree, or the trunk, not the stump. And they drive the trunk into the bank. This root mass that sticks out does two things, okay? This is, <clears throat> this is the round, a curve, okay? Water moves faster on the outside. That means you're gonna get more erosion on the outside, right? So this helps to make the flow, instead of going towards the outside, it pushes it back and turns it back in, okay? So it deflects the direction of the flow. By hitting that, it's gonna make it come back in so you get less erosion on the outside. All of the little root mass is also going to provide habitat, okay? Provide places of refugia, of shade, of um, cover for aquatic insects, especially smaller bugs and smaller fish, right? So they have a few of these um, also that were put in place, again, from the trees that were cut down. Um, <clears throat> this is another, so this goes back to um, maintaining the connection between the stream and, and the land, okay? So allowing floods to occur. Um, this is what is called a wetland shelf or a floodplain shelf, okay? So it allows the flow to flood this area and then recede back down, okay? So a few things here, that provides extra storage of water, okay? So it's not going to just pile up and then go over the bank. Um, it provides a kind of a safe flooding mechanism, right? Also, that adds extra habitat too, okay? So when you get natural flooding occurring and, you're, and the water spills onto this shelf, you're going to get maybe when it recedes deposits of anything that was in the stream, right? Um, when the flows are high, you're going to get extra foraging habitat for fish, right? On new spots that they haven't been on, so new habitat. Um, and then you're getting that exchange of any sort of food or energy sources between um, both sides. So, <clears throat> again, a way to reconnect the stream with the terrestrial land. So, that is what I wanted to bring to talk about. I am happy to continue the conversation if anyone has any questions or discussion about anything. Um, but that's me with my two kids, and this was in Smoky Mountain National Park. And they, with their friends, played in that stream and climbed over those boulders for hours. 
and it warmed my heart. So. I yeah. I'm not sure if it's relevant. Oh, sure. Is it possible to do both and like create like a navigable bypass? Does that help? Does that hurt? To to actually have like a, a place that you can like, still get the benefit of the the straightening and the channelization. Exactly right. Um, I mean, there there are ways that you could maybe. I'm thinking kind of with the mitigation approach, right? Like if you're channelizing this stretch, maybe you try to rehabilitate an area near that to provide more flood storage for that. Um, I think the the Wabashiki wetlands here are a great example of, you know, kind of having that extra storage, right? Having because having that area for floods to um, flood waters to go into, as opposed to trying to confine it, is really the benefit, right? So like having having the Wabashiki wetlands as an area for the Wabash to flood into, right? It it helps to um, it helps to deter against more catastrophic events of a levee breach or something like that. So that's kind of what I'm thinking is if you were to have, then you would have something else to help allow for flood storage. Does that make sense? No. Yeah. In the hypoxic zone then, is there like, so there's not a lot of life in that area. Is there, I mean, I'm sure there's fishing laws like, about that area like because it's all super close on the coastline but i mean is there a way to like i guess mitigate people going there fishing uh, like there's some yeah and I'm, I'm not familiar with all the details about you know the different but i know that it i mean it definitely has impacted fishing industry and stuff like that and tourist industry in that area um but there are a lot of i mean there are a lot of different studies about what can we do to help kind of reduce the impact of that. Um, different ways that we can, um, different ways that we can implement different techniques, to, different techniques to reduce the amount of excess nutrients that are getting in there. So kind of stopping it from where it starts, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Did the Lost Creek litigation happen at the same time as the 641 bypass was being built, or was it, what was the time frame? Um, there was some overlap. Yeah, there was definitely some overlap um, in that. I'm trying to think of, because um, the, the mitigation was done over the span of at least a year because of seasonality and timing and things. Um, I think, it definitely overlapped. I think it was it was probably more kind of in the middle of the stretch of the 641 bypass being built um, because different issues with permitting and construction of that project led to more length and area of of streams and wetlands that needed to be needed to be um, mitigated. Um, and so once that process started, that it was actually our environmental health and safety. Um, director on campus. There's a mitigation bank um, that's online, and I think I think IDNR manages that. Either IDNR or IDEM. Um, and so they know that this is being impacted here, okay, and that the 641 bypass. And so they put that in the bank, and then he noticed that that was being done, and we're in the same hydrologic unit, is what it's called. And so he put in an application to use our stream as part of that mitigation. So. Are you engaged in both the freshman civil engineering and senior civil engineering design courses? Yes. Tell us about the growth in four years. In four years, <laughs> um, well, you have two senior civil or two senior civil senior design students right next to you. Um, it's amazing. <laughs> it's it's amazing. Um, so the freshman design courses, um, it's just ten weeks long. Um, in the in the spring term, and they get a project, and they basically scratch the surface of it, of the actual work that they're doing on it. Um, when they get to senior design, it's a year-long project. It is definitely in-depth, where they're doing a lot of technical design, and it's 
their communication skills, their teamwork skills, it's night and day difference. So you know that every year for the last 12 years, we've had both freshmen and with Riverscape projects. And we break them in with the freshmen. <laughs> <laughs> Uh -huh. bring them to fruition four years later. Uh -huh. Sometimes the same teams. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's a cheap way to get some very good internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have. We ha I wonder if, yeah, because we had one last year um, working on the Fairbanks Park um, along the river, that, the redevelopment. Um, they really enjoyed working on that project, too. Yeah. I thought they did a great job. Um, in the middle, yeah. So a project like that is too big for me to have a handle on, but what I see in my area in the front yard is a farm field on this side. The county dug the ditch about 12 years ago, and it goes under a culvert, under my driveway in a culvert, and then it goes down to the neighbor's culvert. The side by the farm field has filled in, pretty much almost level, and you see a little bit of a V before the culvert at my at my driveway. Then you see it go out the other side and it gets deeper and deeper and it's like two or two almost you know two two and a half feet deep over there before they're culvert. What do I do to prevent <laughs> that from getting deeper on this side and this side is filling in? Uh, yeah. Water off the farm field. I know it's carrying all that stuff and it's going down into a stream that then joins in and goes down into the Wabash River eventually. I know that. Right. Right. Um, but what you're, yeah, I mean, what you're saying is exactly, you know, you're, you're, it's the starting point, it's the starting point of all that. No, it, it absolutely is. Um, and that's, I don't know, that's, that's a hard question for me to answer. Um, and I, I, we get questions like that a lot, but it's, I mean, it, a lot of that is dependent on the property manager, right? And how they manage that property. Um, and so, I mean, talking to someone with DNR, right? That might Are have there some. Plants that I can plant, like at that deep end, to keep it from eroding more, because I can see the gravel forming in the bottom and all that. All that. So something like what I just talked about with the you know native vegetation and seeding it as kind of like a buffer between that and and your spot um, might help. But again, it's not what's happening on your property that's causing the issue, right? It's what's happening upstream of that. And it's, it's hard to be able to manage that. But I mean, something like that on your property could maybe have a little bit of a benefit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you in the back, sir? Your remarks about the uh, river basins and the very area at the top of the Gulf of Mexico that is dead, or is it just, I'm curious to know with the federal efforts to clean our waterways, will that be there forever? Um, I, again, I can't definitively say, but I, I think it is, I think it is fixable, right? So it's just, it's just a pocket of water in that area. And because of the Gulf, you're not getting, you're getting, you know, some tides coming in and out, but you're not getting as big of water movement right in that gulf so that's why all of the when the runoff hits the uh the gulf of mexico it doesn't you're not getting a lot of influx and outflux and transition of it right um but yes there are measures that can be taken and there are currently measures and initiatives out there to try to reduce the amount of excess nutrients that reach the waterways so it's not the end of the world. I don't think so. And is it <laughs> around the globe or major rivers? There, Chesapeake Bay is another one where there's a major issue. And I'm more familiar with work in the Chesapeake Bay because um, just colleagues that I have in that area. Um, but there are a lot of, even on the level of a, you know local municipalities that have um, different different initiatives, different policies, different regulations that they're putting in place on to help manage the non-point source runoff that's getting into the wild because they do have a really big issue in the Chesapeake Bay also with that. Um, so there are definitely measures that are being put in place to reduce the amount of nutrients that reach those water bodies. Yeah. 
Well, I would suggest that in the agricultural community, uh, there are a lot of bad actors, and I'm not calling them bad people, uh, but there are, there are farmers that are using still, at this point in time, they're still using full tillage. They're doing tillage in the fall. Uh, they're destroying the, their soil structure, uh, and that's regrettable because we do have techniques uh, that are involved with soil health, mm -hmm. uh, that include no-till, mm -hmm. and the use of cover crops, that can absolutely, uh, Susan, eliminate the problem that you referred to. And so I think our challenge, I mean, your challenge is how do we channel all this water? I think the bigger challenge is how do we uh, uh, limit the amount of water that's getting into our channels? And if we can convert all of our agricultural land essentially to a sponge with root channels that are intact throughout the season without going through there with a chisel plow, and ruining all of that beautiful, that, that beautiful ecosystem mm -hmm. with all of the roots and the channels and the wormholes and, the, and those intricate uh, web of life in the soil, if we can get our farmers on track. And again, I'm not, when I say bad actors, I don't mean bad people. I mean people that just aren't quite up to speed on, on, on farming techniques and, and nutrient management. Right. Right. And so there is, yeah, no, and I, I agree. It's, it's definitely, it's a, like I said, it's a bigger watershed scale issue, right? It's not the point of location. It is, it is that bigger issue. Um, and there are, I mean, there are practices, like you just mentioned, um, to help reduce the amount of runoff that we're getting in non point source pollution. There are, there are techniques available, but they're not always implemented. Yeah. And I would, I would go along with that. I actually have a farm. I don't actually farm it. I manage it. I've gone out, you know, a couple times to um, lobby for National Audubon on the farm bills. If they would give more money to Conservation Reserve Program, the Key Whip Program, the Wetland Reserve Program, people would still have those buffer strips. They would still have, you know, areas where there's big ditches. They'd have those, you know, warm season grasses. Farmers with the increases in taxes and insurance, they're doing corner to corner production just so that they can keep a hold of their property. And it's unfortunate because we do know that no-till and some of these other practices are better, but it's simply survival for a lot of them. So when those farm bills come up, they're not just about all the subsidies, it's also a lot of things in there are environmentally oriented, and I don't think that information gets out to people to lobby. And in Indiana, we sit in a really good place because we have people on the appropriations committee, we have people on the ag committees, we hold some pretty good uh, lobbying if we can talk to them. Yeah. I would say <clears throat> in the last 15 years I've noticed massive amounts of uh, field cotton going down. You know, on the tillable acreage. But I have to assume that happens in Illinois and uh, Ohio. And what effect does that have on the, like the aquifers or the putting in drainage tile? Yeah, drainage, yeah, tile. drainage yeah. tile in the field. Um, so I think, again, it's kind of having the opposite effect of creating storage in the floodplain, right? Because you're wanting to move it out and drain it off the land. And so um, you're, you're going to get more of that in surface runoff and in flooding as opposed to infiltration and storage within the floodplain itself is what I would uh, that's what I would foresee so you're actually starving the aquifers not completely but it's not it's it's you're moving the water away from where it would naturally go yeah yeah great well, I, I know your students came smart, and, they, and the rest of us are going home smarter than we can. So, <laughs> thank you so much to uh, Dr. Miller. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.